I read and learned a lot from anthropology, sociology, literary studies, and philosophy. Uh, so I am a bit of a hybrid being. Uh, and my hunch is that one of the discomforts that many readers will have with this book, whether they be sociologists or historians, will be precisely this, this, this impossibility of being able to slot it within the disciplinary debates. Hello and welcome everyone to Gulf Lok. I'm Antara Chakrabarti and today we meet again for another episode of Bookmarked where we are going to discuss a very important book entitled Elementary Aspects of the Political Histories from Global South. We are very fortunate today to have with us author, eminent and dear historian Prathama Banerjee. Not just that, but we also do have four esteemed discussants with us, which include Professor Sujata Patil, Professor Saurabh Dubey and Professor Sadhan Jha, and not to mention our very own Devnath Pathak. Therefore, without wasting much time, I would like to open the platform to Professor Devnath Pathak to give us an overview of the book, and then we move on to other discussions. Initially, I thought I will do a quick overview, but uh, given the richness of the book, uh, it seems uh, I might uh, spend a little longer time. The book, uh, Elementary Aspects of the Political, uh, four grounds, as the author says, multitudinous dialectics, defying borders and hierarchies of disciplines, and minds, sovereignty and sociality, with volumes of counterintuitive ideas. What this means could be understood better only by undertaking the journey the book invites for, with riches of details, gems of materials, and priceless provocations. It means seeing the political where one may not expect it, if guided by the axiomatic universal set standards pigeonholed textbooks, and any list of thinkers and philosophers that gets revisited only over decades in course curricula in universities. The imperative for a point of departure is very well flagged in the beginning of the book to locate the political. If it is not entirely a null hypothesis, one has to turn to the shifting cartographies or the cross pollination of thoughts and actions, histories and philosophies preachings and performative enactments, and most importantly, the so-called non-political. Thus, the book also delivers in text as well as subtext a breakaway intellectual framework to dislodge philosophy, reaffirm the relation of history and philosophy, and to question the history of colonial modernity and thereof intellectual binaries. The latter may trigger the interest of the two scholars present on the panel uh, today, namely uh, Professor Saurabh Dubey and Professor Sudhata Patel, in addition to others not present here who have pondered upon this in their uh, respective ruminations. More than this, the book is a mine of ideas, no doubt about that. It has luminous epistemes knit together to deliver to us an ontology of the political. In my copy of the book, almost every page is so underlined that it is bewildering amount of thoughts I wish to share. Such a rich book that there could only be a blissfully partial review as I do hereafter. But before that, it is a reviewer's, a reviewer's personal imperative to take a quick note of the relevance of the book at this juncture in intellectual history. The book comes at a time when the idea, the very idea of political is a bone of contention in popular common sense, or perhaps it always was. There is a prevalent way of thinking about the political and politics in contemporary India, which could be pithily termed as a La Amitabh Bachchan mindset. It refuses to acknowledge the political in seemingly non-political, extra-political, or what is fancifully known on social media as apolitical. Amitabh Bachchan, as we all know, was most vociferous about such a mindset after he decided to quit uh, from active party politics uh, in the face of charges, allegations about the Beaufort scandal in the mid-1980s. But the mindset is general. It, it echoes a common scheme about 
the idea of political and that too in spite of an illustrious history of youth politics in university campuses and glorious instances of students movement all over the world the scholars the eponymous owls of minerva hesitate to see that even a work of scholarship underpins the political just like some stars believe that their artwork has no relation with the political and yet one is usually trapped in the transition narratives which uh, the author in this book criticizes or imprisoned by one or other theoretical spectacles to reason with politics a covert fear or an overt ambition makes everybody keen to show a politically sanitized intellectual or artwork this is hilarious since the slippery tautology that is everything is political became an academic common sense ever since michel foucault assumed a divine significance in theoretical reasoning god if there is any in the precincts of universities may know which pandemic killed the idea of intellectual politics in south asia at what point in time in history hence one of the eminent scholars once said when asked eurocentrism is long dead villain which is not the case as it seems and therefore the author in this book returns to that question it is in this backdrop that the book is significant to a reader like me prathama banerjee delivers a particular interjection a possibility to explore a continuity in intellectual politics or as she says being politic rather than doing politic there is an uncanny ontology of the political at the heart of modern politics in which non political or extra political are inevitable accompaniment ever since the advent of it in colonial south asia as a relatively younger academic with the irrepressible desire to see the emperors of the world naked i usually go agog when i find the canons dethroned and divinity decapitated it happens on occasions in the book despite disparagingly acute humility of the author my favorite of all is in the last chapter of the book titled people as fiction the critical decentering of someone like jack ronsior's politics of literature unfolds it is juxtaposed with the thespian dramaturge utpal dutt's steaming hot tea the essays that dutt staged as a conversation among a philosopher a playwright a theater director a linguist and us the audience the meta genre of theater or the larger than life importance of theatricality or the utmost power of a people's poet or even the broader scope of jatra delivers a rasa aesthetics that responds to history and effectively effectively move people into becoming political without even without shouting slogans thumping chest or issuing manifesto the last chapter of the book persuades us to return to the preceding chapters on organized along the keywords such as self action idea party and the people the author is kind enough to hint this necessity in the chapter number 2 titled philosophy theater and real politic was on offer the model of sanyasi fakir renouncer some kind of anti social is pivotal here in the discussion there may be variable compositions and dispositions of various figures such as starting from chanakya vivekanand sri aurobindo mahatma gandhi swami sahajanand saraswati swami agnivesh agnivesh and as disheartening as it appears even our live and kicking narendra modi and before him another dubious swami who control a great deal of power namely chandra swami and so many others the details with each name profoundly vary and pendulum swings from religious spiritual secular to utter right wing pragmatism but then the point is straight forward the imagery of renouncer matters one can perhaps stretch the imagination and begin to ask whether rahul gandhi is yet to adequately profess and perform the renouncer hood qua sanyasi or fakir status and hence he is yet to become a dramatic person in the theater of politics in india as is the case with with action wherein artha a kind of action is never dissociated for, from karma on one hand and drama of real politic on the other after all 
Chanakya was not merely what the fragmented history informs us. He was in a great deal theatrical reconstruction from 7th or 8th century Vishakha Dutt's play Mudra Rakshas to 20th century serial, television serial of Chandraprakash Dvivedi. Related to this, that we configure the idea of political from the Bhagavad Gita to Panch Tantra through the matrix of Rasas. Likewise, revisiting Vivekananda, it may occur to any reader as to how an oversimplified imagery of the youth monk is suitable for a particular brand of politics. Some resort to oversimplification in order to do what Karl Mannheim elsewhere called unmasking and debunking, and some other to create a brand militant nationalism. It is specific to the discussion on action that we begin to see more nuances around and in renunciation. For adoption of non-identity, non-self need not be an unequivocal renunciation of the world. Instead, it is as much this worldly as it connotes the other world, and at times entirely muddied in the whirlpool of the world. Such a self in this discussion, in this book, operationalizes a novel kinship in which gods and humans, cosmic divinity and human existential struggle are related. Towards this, the author returns us Bankim's fairly aesthetic Anushilan or Sri Aurobindo's Karma Yoga or Ambedkar's Buddhist idea of Karma Dhamma. The urge to see the political seems to be towards both the ordinary everyday and exceptional extraordinary and in the tension between the two as well. The story gets more complicated with the insertion of labor in relation with hunger and struggle as a category of action which appears more than an em empty signifier that's been central in sociology and economics that mo most of us as students learned somewhat blindly. Here in this book, Marx, Gandhi, Tagore, Ambedkar, Kazi Nazrul Islam, Manik ba Chanbandopadhyay, Satyajit Ray, and the artist Zainul Abedin become part of the staged discourse. Many layers of everyday, ethical, given, oppressive, tumble out of the margins. Much alike self and action, ideas too have their gray zones with enmeshed black and white. Idea of equality with the specter of inequality and difference finds as much resonance in Bankim's Samya or Advaitism or in Islamic Tawhid or in Buddhist Maitri and Dhamma or in Ambedkar's Buddhist Navyana or in Narayan Guru's Samudayam with due variation of nature and scope, of course. We are led to fathom equality in difference as a spiritual register with or without a God in modern politics. The, the sum and substance is that Iqbal, poet Iqbal, made Lenin encounter Allah and for holding an Islamic position against the grains, Kazi Nazrul Islam was even alleged to be a bad Muslim. And likewise, if we go back in time, we know that now celebrated as a saint poet, Kabir did not get as many bouquets as brickbats during his lifetime. Nor did Asadullah Khan Ghalib, the poet during the time of the last Mughal, who loved to drink and declined to visit the mosque. Such a take on the idea of equality instantly demands from the undergraduate and postgraduate students of sociology and anthropology in India to stop mugging up Andre Bete's half-baked exegesis on natural social inequality. And simultaneously, it enables us to scrutinize the significance of economic rationality associated with equality that has become dominant over the decades. In the backdrop of political idea of equality, there is a curious dialectic of economic and spiritual, and if one can dare say, social. Simplistic Marxist logic may not suffice since the question of caste, class, gender haunt rethinking equality, as was the case with Achintya Kumar Sengupta, a literary figure in early 20th century Bengal who called himself, and I quote from this book, a poet of the shoemakers, carpenters and sweepers. A case of vernacular Marxism surfaces as we make sense of the innumerable Bengali literature recasting Marx, the manifesto, and the Marxism 
in relation with Buddhism and Islam, caste and communalism. But mind it, not the communal of the communal politics of the political right. Instead, Radha Kamal Mukherjee's stagial formulation of community life. Thus, economic and spiritual are, as author says, extra political forces that simultaneously drive and delimit the political. Furthermore, the Gramscian idea of political party as the modern prince acquires dramatic velocity when perceived through the mass, the political community that comes into being. How does the massification occur? Historical trajectory of the Indian National Congress and the Communist Party of India provide exciting details in this book fraught with counterintuitive facts. In short, the plot has markers in terms of confrontation, negotiations, and competition of a sort between mass and class, and caste, of course, playing a decisive cameo role. It is the two competing models of vanguardism, namely the Satyagrahi and the communist, with the internationalism and the homegrown variety of socialism as goalposts. The soul of this discussion, to my mind, however, is in the discussion on people as fiction that adds more muscles against the party-based idea of politics. People get played out in aesthetic uh, framework in theater and literature, but author reminds us it need not be mistaken for Walter Benjamin's aesthetics of power. And toward putting the people in the center, the book presents a wonderful critique of realism, particularly ethnographic realism, qua factism of sort. Not only it brings back the Rasa theory with a wide-eyed view of historical encounters, but also we get to see an intricate relation of people and the detailed atmospherics. My personal prejudice, it is eventually a good drama that makes us believe in who we are and what we do. To end, the book is indeed an incredible dramatic treat to me with gentle punches and firm arguments. A good drama can seldom be summarized, and I confess my broad stroke in this presentation has not. But suffice to say, given the good drama that I see in this book, I staunchly believe in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dev Patuk, for giving a broad idea about the book. Now, I would like to turn to <laughs> uh, Professor Saurabh Dube. So it's a pleasure and more to be at this event. Thank you for the invitation. I first encountered Prathama Banerjee and her formidable intelligence almost three decades ago. I was a freshly minted PhD, speaking for the first time at the CHS, Center for Historical Studies seminar in JNU. Those were heady days, and Prathama was the bright spark whose question lit up and partly singed the seminar space during the discussion after. I'd met a fellow traveler. There've been intermittent entanglements since, though only once in person. I was a reader for Prathama's first monograph with OUP and she for an edited volume of mine also with OUP. It was in the nature of her comments, she ended up contributing an afterword uh, to that book. And so I begin by asking, what kind of intelligence is this, which shines as well through elementary aspects of the political? Entirely in tune with Prat Prathama's own querying of prior certainties, a priori claims, ready resolutions, we need to register that intelligence also is constitutively not one. Prathama's intelligence formatively braids together the analytical and the hermeneutic. My reference, of course, is to the main modalities of modern knowledges uh, in the human sciences over recent centuries. And these are the analytical as based on logic or mathematics, where details are important only in their correspondence and upholding of a larger story. The hermeneutic as based on the close, on the analogy of the close reading of texts, uh, where what matters is the intimate grasp of details. In scholarship concerning South Asia, the distinction between the analytical and the hermeneutic was brought home through the Pesh Chakravarti's discussion of Heidegger under the sign of the hermeneutic and of Marx under the mark of the analytical. But there's more to the picture. The history and anthropology of the history and anthropology of anthropology and history suggests the coming together 
again and again and the falling apart of the analytical and the hermeneutic in the making of the modern human science. Uh, it seems to me that the analytical critically appears in her in, in Pratima's questioning of presumptions that uphold arguments. And um, so I turn to a delightful passage. Um, Pratima writes, currently, Marxism has been replaced by, I quote, currently Marxism has been replaced by liberalism as the universal frame within which to think politics across the globe. Chris Bailey reads much of Indian political thinking between the 1820s and 1940s as flowing into a worldwide age of liberalism. Despite liberalism's complicity in the imperial project and despite the fact of colonial difference. Even more tellingly, Andrew Sartori uh, shows not only Western educated elites, but also poor Indian peasants to be liberals, even if they might not have known it themselves. He sees Bengal peasants fighting for land rights against rent seeking landlords as bearers of a vernacular version of the original Lockean idea of the property of the property constituting power of labor without considering the fact that the peasants common sense might be might very well have been the original version of this idea and you know i was reminded here of christopher hill's discussion of the levelers and diggers and actually the fact that um that you know Locke was crucial in destroying the commons um, I continue with the quote, this is not the place to debate the validity of reading world history as a history of liberalism. Let me just register the real questions at stake here. It is that of Western European philosophy's presence at the heart of colonial and post-colonial politics via a charting of philosophy's global career as ideology. So here is a, a querying, a questioning of the very premises which uphold arguments, and that's the presence of the analytical, and you know, um, and other examples abound. The hermeneutic um, in Pratima's intelligence appears in the creativity of her readings of texts and familiar subjects, whether it is Vivekanand, Gali, or theater in Bengal. So let me actually unravel this larger issue through um through a through through three quick appreciations and a few questions um this is for starters you know it's going to be a long engagement these um appreciations and questions particularly turn on prathama's undoing of philosophy through the doing of philosophy her undoing of taxonomy through her doing of taxonomy and her doing of politics through the resurrection of politics, a resurrection that is appears certainly not as redemption and its teleologies, but as perhaps a third coming. Um, the quick appreciations. First, without putting a fine point on the matter, Pratima can and often cuts through the crap. Uh, she cuts through the crap. Uh, here, it seems to me, um, she follows Talal Asad's unraveling of presumptions and premises that uphold arguments. Second, Prathama points to the not oneness, uh, in this case, of elementary aspects of self, action, idea, and people. In this pointing towards the not oneness, of these categories, entities, there is a bit of naiti, naiti, not this, not this. And there is a bit of the constant splitting, fissuring of the world and by extension, the world. Finally, I cannot be more delighted about Pratima's unprivileging of the philosophical. Two of my best friends are Ajay Skarya and Anupma Rao. Uh, and man, have I struggled. So, um, the questions ahead. These are questions that Pratima asks and questions that I ask her, keeping in view especially varieties of the post-colonial and the decolonial and other perspectives. Even as we undo taxonomies, do not these taxonomies yet world or ontologize themselves? 
In the precise questioning of the taxonomies, can we not let them world the worlds at large as the totality that stands against difference, for instance? Concerning elementary aspects of the political, I'm referring to the questioning, but also certainties that are brought to bear on modernity, modernism, and Europe, except when in, in one's own dialogue. But have these categories, entities, processes ever been that stable? I find parallels of procedure here with salient strands of critical philosophy with which uh, the book rightly, substantially differs and learns from. Does not the unyoking of politics as a priori from philosophy, as already given, a move that I love, yet entail particular presumptions, ones that turn the querying of the philosophical is into the after philosophical claims on what politics ought to be? And is there a V at work here? Are we placed in a seminar on politics where the only subjects are participants and all that matters is the power of argument, the compulsion to truth? What happens then to the experience of the world that subjects in making already have that epistemically precedes the reflections of the knowing subject? And what of the heterogeneity of subjects? Again, not simply on factual registers, but on critically conceptual ones. Here I'm asking too about the forms of occlusion, occlusion. Here I'm asking too about the forms of occlusion that underlie the separation between the philosophical and its imperatives and the political and her ethics. Can such a separation, principally heuristic, yet simultaneously substantive, can such a separation subordinate subjects of different reasons to the intellectual's plural yet exclusive demarcations, especially the becoming of politics? In the querying of the philosophical at large and the political as emergent, how are we to stay longer with corporeal, affective, sensuous ways of experiencing, knowing, being, which this book endorses, of course? What are the concrete ways of undoing? What are the concrete ways of undoing pervasive, persistent presumptions of fully fabricated subjects possessed of an already intimated reason and its politics to be? Surely, none of this is to claim that formations of subjects are pre-social or pre-political in any sense, derived as these they are from necessarily heterogeneous yet ever overlapping imminent life wells. Put differently, can apprehensions of political life eschew starting off with the bounded intentional subject while at the same time foregrounding embodiment, embodiment and sensuous life? Here, might effective circumstances in embodied states, for example, take experiential precedence over, while being constitutively coeval with, emergences of politics? Indeed, with subject and sense shaped by elements of experience, might we take a cue from Gadamer in order to ask, how might we open ourselves to the awareness of being exposed to the labors of history that exceed, that exceed the uses of documentary history and explanatory anthropology? Can the extras of the analytical be drawn together with the extras of the political as routinely woven into everyday and academic modern worlds, each also announcing not moves of transcendence, but acceptance of imminence? How might such imminent attributes of social life, including the place and play of longing and loss, color and smell, the sensitive and the sensuous, be compellingly, contendingly drawn into descriptions, woven into narratives, rather than pursue what Johannes Fabian described as a sense-less science. Do these queries put a certain spin on the need to think through conceptual categories of a cerebral provenance by bringing them in conjunction with the quotidian configuration of the terrains they describe, the resolute requirements of social worlds, whose very imminence makes distinct claims upon all subjects and their several pursuits. Can this be done while keeping in view the insight of the radical Durkheim, uh, the insight that it is in routine worlds that the unimaginable is imagined? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Saurabh Dubey. Now, uh, I would like to uh, turn to Professor uh, Sadhan Jha. It's to a tough book in many ways. I I'll explain why it is a tough book book not in a negative sense of the term but in a very positive sense of the term you know it's a to me okay let me start by you know uh, quoting a couplet 
from someone dev earlier passingly mentioned kabir kabir once said that kavira khara bazar mein liya lukathi hath jo ghar phuka apna chale hamare sath so there is a, there is a it's it's about iconoclasm it's about burning the house and it's about the spirit of subversion i am flagging this spirit of subversion do the author somehow i might have missed this has never used this word subversion politics as subversion but throughout the book i have heard this echo in so many more with so many ways that she is not just talking about politics as subversion but she is also while writing this book actually practicing the 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 act of subverting the established academic you know um, ways of doing politics ways of doing political history or ways of doing what she in epilog epilog says that it is about relation between for uh, philosophy and history the reason i am saying it is subversive because at each at various levels various layers she is subverting the established the canonical the dominant ways of doing such an exercise and precisely because she is subverting at every level the book becomes quite tough but that's the provocation and in that sense the book is very provocative book and for this reason also i would like to congratulate uh, prathama for for the provocation a few points that i just loved in the book and also would uh, flag few counter provocations you know by way of you know uh, discussion or by way of also inviting readers to read the book it's a it's the meditation on politics political history the reason i'm using this word i mean uh, it may not be a good word saying political history because the way we have in history uh, classroom we have been taught about political history is very different and that has been challenged here time and again but in that sense in 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 sense of challenging in sense of subverting the very idea of political history it actually opens up new ways of doing history and politics or how to conceptualize what she argues as you know a, a pol uh, modern political being she is very conscious about history not in a very you know quotidian disciplinary sense of the term but the presence of history can never be denied here so it's it's a meditation on 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 uh, politics uh, in so many ways and uh, in 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 beginning uh, she very clearly uh, tells us what she is not doing for example she is not taking the the anthropological route of looking at politics or politics as practice or politics as experience but in in so many different ways she is also surprising because in many things that she she talks particularly in the later chapters which dev also mentioned there is definitely lot of insights that a political anthropologist or uh, anthropology of politics you know uh, can mobilize so do obviously as a historian she is trying to limit her canvas her perspective and she is saying that she is not doing this she is not doing that and then she actually presents what she wants to do yet there are many things that she is saying that she is not doing consciously has actually repercussions in what she is presenting the book surprises uh, in many ways a uh, book surprises as a as a student of history uh, because when she starts uh, in the in the first few chapters you come across familiar figures gandhi vivekanand uh, uh, bankim rabindranath tagore these are, are familiar sites of doing intellectual history uh, in in uh, colonial india yet she surprises you on on many occasions you when i was reading and this is i am i'm uh, sharing my experience as a reader so in in first few chapters i thought that okay 
there is there is something which i often come across and which has been talked a lot in history classrooms history textbooks it's about the fallacy of what i would call missing medieval so while talking about bankim chand or Uh, while talking about vivekananda it is quite obvious that people go to vedanta people go to ancient indian philosophy bypassing the medieval here again i i i felt some kind of i mean this is a counter uh, provocation from me that while she does talk about the figure of fakir while talking about vivekananda or while she does mention about the the muslim body i was searching for the muslim body in, in that analytical uh, uh, framework which i did not find in the first few chapters until i i came to second or third part of the book and this is why it actually surprises you you think that there is something which the the book or the author is missing and then the author reveals another side of her her analytical uh, rigor but again i'm 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 sharing this you know my joy of reading the book rather than as as a reviewer uh, you know taking a distance uh, perspective the best part uh, of the book that i liked was uh, something that is very dry to me economics and uh, there are two chapters equality and spirituality equality and reason now uh, to give you a sense i mean the reason i i like this uh, was because and the reason i quite dislike many uh, books on economics is that economics is all about commensurability uh, even though anthropologists have actually pushed us to look at the incommensurable part of economics or economic life so this is this is something that uh, i quite you know uh, it was a pleasure uh, reading the this these two chapters and let me share uh, one particular um, which is also quite titillating uh, you know this is where she is on page 151 and 152 she is you know quoting uh, sibram chakrabarti and talking about economics not just not in a very dry sense but economics as case and then she doesn't stop there she she then goes and uh, offers us a very unique perspective where economics is an an intimacy of sexual encounter too so this is just to give you a sense of you know the in incommensurable aspects of economics the 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 subversion of the dominant that i i initially mentioned while looking at some very stale i mean stale for me i'm a uh, uh, category like economics the the last few chapters which are wonderful read uh, not that earlier chapters are not uh, uh, wonderful read but in last two chapters one get more you know one is drawn towards the empirical you know kind of uh, Uh, details uh, and these two chapters are uh, you know initiate you to very unfamiliar sites while the earlier chapters were about bankim uh, gandhi uh, ambedkar uh, or or vivekanand uh, these two sites are very uh, they 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 mobilize different kind of actors from theater from literature and it was sheer delight to uh, read discussions on kallol movement on uh, the relation between anchal uh, sahitya and uh, politics it's 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 very it's ironical that outside the, those who are familiar with uh, history of bengal Uh, there is very little uh, in in discourse on uh, in in uh, historiography on the literature and politics uh, in in this way. So it, it was it was sheer delight 
so here i was just you know wandering you know outside bengal you know there there are uh, figures like phaniswar nath venu very closely associated with uh, you know the anchal sahitya very political see do does mention uh, renu in another context but in this context somehow you know uh, she does not bring renu or you know figures which may enrich this discussion further but then a book or a chapter has its own limitation uh, so that's that's fine the another you know counter uh, provocation that i would offer here is and the, this missing medieval thing is is something that i would again uh, uh, request perhaps that you know though there are you know a few chapters but yet i feel that you know we somehow we don't we have not addressed how medieval uh, philosophies how the medieval period has influenced the the modern political being uh, in a very substantive manner the second is um, second missing and second my second counter political uh, counter provocation is about the missing contemporary in the book uh, this is i was wondering why the contemporary is missing in 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 terms of the uh, you know serious analytical uh, engagement or in terms of posing the question perhaps that was not her agenda but this is this is something that i am thinking as a reader um, the third counter provocation is uh though in epilogue she has overtly uh, uh, mentioned that she is looking at the relation between philosophy and history but in the disco in in this analytical engagement with the the political uh, particularly the modern political being i found that there is a missing historical also uh, uh, and there is there is very less analytical engagement on the historical it, it, that goes into the 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 construction constitution of the modern political the historical uh, which she mobilizes is may, is merely in terms of the details again this is very rudimentary very you know raw uh, i might be missing many things but i just thought to share you know the kacha pakka readers uh, viewpoint um, thank you thank you so much uh, uh, professor jha now i think all of us uh, would agree that we are getting impatient to uh, listen to professor sujata patel so extremely um important in terms of fashioning my own understanding and both of the tribal question as well as of the um, um of the post colonial so it 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 was very important to read the present text uh whose canvas is extremely wide and i am finding it difficult to put together all my thoughts um in this short time it needs a larger engagement and it is to prathma's great um intellectual um uh, corpus that uh, that this book becomes so difficult to engage with in such a short time so this canvas being so wide and the themes going in from history to um uh, to philosophy to um to philosophical positions to um uh, to literature to theater and to the social it becomes um, both comprehensive as well as um as well as difficult to put together um critique but i'll try and i'm going to try this through a dialogue of a different parallel kind which i personally have been involved with this dialogue is the distinction between the social and the sociological now this has a long history 
within the northern global world, this history starts off. That is the di dialogue and the and the conflict between the social and the sociological starts off from the mid 60s and late 60s onwards. While the dialogue that you are talking between political and the politics starts somewhere, as you say, the center which was set up in Paris started in 1982. So there is a pre there, there is a 10 to 15 years prior history of this. And this history, interestingly, has a different genealogy in terms of what you mean by elementary and in terms of what one means by ontological. And I want to discuss both these aspects, which are there um, in, 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 in enormous detail and enorm because you bring in a lot of um, information data to put these, these elements together. <clears throat> now, as I said, that the whole question of the social emerges with a critique of the sociological uh, and the limitations of the sociological. And there are two movements in that. And that's where the, I want to bring in both the global north and global south. We see it in a very small way in sociological imagination, but it comes out brilliantly in the coming crisis of Western sociology in 1970. And from there onwards, it moves at two levels. First, it moves in a theoretical questioning and query about what is the limitation of the sociological in its relationship with modernity, which is one of the projects that you also try to unravel. And the second part relates to the methodological, to a critique of positivism, to a critique of science and natural science, and therefore a, therefore a proposition about what is the ontological in the context of the critique of science. And that is a very important element of the, of the, of the entire um, a prognosis that emerges from the 1970s across to the 1990s and 2000s because it separates out sociology from social and it transcends sociology with social theory. So no longer do we talk of sociological theory, we talk of social theory and you will find books after books after books presenting what is social theory. And within the global north, social theory is all about doing, finding out methodologically what is possible for sociology to argue, which is also part of the project that you are presenting to us in this book. You are, of course, talking about what the, what the political can make itself out from the uh, for, uh, pol politics can make itself out from the political or the uh, and uh, extra political ex or the domestification of the of the of uh, the non-political and we have a range of answers here and the range of answers are related to risk trust and you are talking of both of these in your text because at every point of time when you slip from um, political to extra political to non-political, it's, it's the risk that it, it, it engages, individuals engage with when they, uh, when they discuss their own power, they understand their own uh, politics and their own power. And, and yet in all this, there has to be without trust, there is no politics. So there is therefore a discussion on modernity and the sociological in the context of the social. So that is at the first level in the global north. But the second level of the discussion in the global north has been, as I said, 
starting with the critique of positivism. And this critique of positivism has led to a um, proposition that we need to have a tool to understand the mythological. And that tool was first conceptualized within sociology. It had come earlier in anthropology, but in sociology, it was first theorized by Gulnar as reflexivity, though it has its, it has its uh, prior claims in, within anthropology. And with that, we see an entire uh, emergence of discussion on various experiments with epistemology, ultimately uh, resulting in the text of Pierre Bourdieu on reflexivity and on um, outline of theory of practice, where practice becomes the way to think about the ontological. This is, in very brief, the discussion in the global north. But there is one more point in this discussion, which is very important, I think, which, which makes me immediately tell you that this is the absence which I find in your text. This discussion comes again in the 70s and 80s, parallel to Bodhu in the area of critical realism. How do we do science? How do we establish the empirical when we, when we discuss the ontological? Is there a connection between the two? Actually, the empirical is the way you start the first paragraph. As I was growing up, the politics was all around me. It's the empirical of the personal coming as a legitimate scientific truth for examining the future, tracks that come afterwards. Then a small mention of Dipesh Chakravarti saying the small history of the subaltern is taken as an empirical fact that this is why we start with colonialism. And as Sadhan Jha just pointed out, the medieval is really very important here. So, Coming back to critical realism, what is it about critical realism that Im intervenes at this point in the whole debates that happen? What re and, and, and this is significant because it, it is related to the analytical. It is related to asking the question, do we dismiss the analytical completely? Or do we, do we engage with the analytical in trying to find an alternate ontological, which is not in the way Durkheim talks about and Durkheim's understanding of positivism is, social fact, um, things in itself, um, uh, the two kinds of uh, elements that he talks about, the methodological. The ontological then, in the discussion that emerges, is on the methodological. It is about how to under it is about how not to understand the world, not as a lab, not as a survey, not as um, a set of uh, ethnographic interventions, but it is to understand how the empirical, which is based on experiences, observations, and measurements, is related to the actual events which are symptoms of mechanisms, things, products which are basis of our experience, and ultimately to the real generative mechanisms, causes, power, structures that produce events. This is what distinguishes Durkheim from Guha. The ontological is, and I'll define it in the way we as sociologists understand it, the ontological is what is, I repeat, what is, is the consequence of that which has been. What is, what is today, is the consequence of what has been. Guha's elementary aspects 
is about methodologically trying to grasp this in terms of what is the consequence of that which has been, because he knows that it is real. I just mentioned the real is so important in critical realism. The real is so important because it deals with events, etc., which is there, but it's not there. And therefore, the methodological is to be grasped out. This, Pratima, is the, is the framework for Anibal Kihano's colonialism, coloniality um, um, essay. It's, a, it, it's, it's an essay that brings out what is, is the consequence of that which has been. This kind of project, I understand, to have been there in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and 70s in sociology. It was there in Nigeria. It was there in India. D.P. Mukherjee had it. Um, A.K. Saran had it. You can see it in the work of Akibo Akinsola. All of these people try to extract the cultural from it without understanding how the methodological part is as important as the elements of it. And therefore, the elements are not important. The methodological part is important without which the elements don't make sense. And the question that I have is, where is the science here? And because it's not its engagement, it doesn't fit in with the questions it asks. And it cannot bring together the vast arena of, um, I mean, I'm amazed at the vastness of literature being referred to and the vastness of, uh, um, of, uh, of uh, information that is brought together without that scaffolding, which makes me think that it leads you into, a, into being a poem, and it's so cogently written, it's so candid in its presentation, it's so logical in the way it has argued, but it doesn't satisfy me as a social scientist. My last comment would then be that, um, if I were, I looked at the index again, and I find it very interesting that people I hold as classic scholars who have changed the whole notion in contemporary social, uh, social science about how to see social science in India are not mentioned. The, the contemporary, which is, um, and its inequalities in terms of gender, caste, class. I mean, talking of um, uh, in, e you know equality and inequality, I also realize there's no discussion on hierarchy. It's very interesting. Hierarchy is mentioned in different contexts. These are the points where the political and the politics you know, conflict and emerge together in new ways, if at all, um, you would agree with me. Lastly, this is also, as I said, something to do with uh, methods, methodology, science, and analysis. And um, I would have um, um, the archival, um, uh, the enormous archival, um, um, entanglement and 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 uh, uh, and intervention of the reading of this archival material I saw in the politics of time um, somehow get, got lost here. So, uh, is this a book of social science? I don't think so. But is this a book which everyone would like to read as an essay of reflection and contemplation? of what is happening in the late 19th and early 20th century? Yes. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Pratima. Thank you very much. I am totally overwhelmed by the attention 
and the fidelity with which all of you have engaged with this book um, and also because of the you know reanimation of old memories including of really intense discussion and debate the spirit of the adda which we are missing so much in the last one and a half years so i am indeed super excited and super grateful uh, to all of you so let me begin by clarifying in a sense my disciplinary position i think because many of the questions especially sujatas but also in some ways as sadans and saurabhs uh, in very different ways uh, have brought the discipline question center stage is this a book of history is this a book of political theory is this a book of social science or is it a poem now i'm not sure this much i can say with total confidence that this is not a book of social science and it does not seek to be uh it did not seek to be a poem but if it is i'm very happy um uh, now and it, this is a rare opportunity for me to be sitting amongst uh, a group of well known sociologists and speaking in some senses my training is in history as you all know uh but uh, i have always been seen as bit of a prodigal historian by my own teachers including the very dear uma chakravarti for obvious reasons that i i have begun my work with my first book via a critique of the discipline of history and the kind of imprisonment of imagination in the name of quote unquote evidence that it may create i read and learned a lot from anthropology sociology literary studies and philosophy uh so i am a bit of a hybrid being uh and my hunch is that one of the discomforts that many readers will have with this book whether they be sociologists or historians will be precisely this 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 impossibility of being able to slot it within the disciplinary debates because and it is a deliberate move uh, you may say that it is a bit of a hubris a bit of an intellectual arrogance perhaps but you might also see see it as you know a, a bit of a struggle of a contemporary scholar against the way the disciplinary frameworks have been settled uh, which as sujatha rightly pointed out were settled in a context not necessarily our own so my struggle against not just history as a discipline but the over determining categories of history uh, uh such as the political which is of course the ur category of historical scholarship just like the social is the kind of foundational category of sociological and social anthropological scholarship uh worldwide globally which has led me in a sense to of course question the assumptions behind what we today think as self evidently political but as i argue in the book the questioning of that assumption about the political is impossible without simultaneously dislodging and troubling the concept of the social as well because it is in that binary the political and the social that the modern disciplines similarly the binary between the political and the economic the binary between the political and the artistic in which our disciplines have been framed which is why as you can see while my chapters are on self act idea and people they are also chapters on the philosophical the sociological the social the economic the aesthetic um you know and so on uh so these are the two kind of levels at which i'm trying to make my argument 
Now, which is why, for instance, Ajata, to come back to your point, uh, I do not have any stake in thinking through the concept of secularism, either in the way that my colleague Rajiv Bhargav, uh, uh, his work is extraordinary. And I've learned a lot from that work. But I just do not have a stake in that concept. Similarly, I do not have a stake in the concept of religion, uh, which, as so many, including Tala Lasad says, is not necessarily a universal concept. Right. So it's, it's trying to, in a sense, it's a struggle to work in the given language, but also work outside the language of academics, which is a struggle I'm sure that shows up in the book. Uh, and um, now, having said, I mean, having clarified my disciplinary position and why the book's nature is of the kind that it is, uh, it kind of falling outside the standard social science parameters, but also outside the standard humanities parameters, as it were. The point that I take quite seriously, uh, the, the two points that have come from almost all of you, I take very seriously, and I will actually work on that. The, the question of the medieval is something that I am myself struggling with quite a bit. Uh, um, not so much because the medieval do not seem to raise its head as it does inevitably in some of the chapters of the book, including in the first chapter, Vivekananda's, when I argue, for instance, that Vivekananda is talking Vedanta, but not Shankaracharya, but the 17th century Vivek Churamani. Uh, and, and, and that's where the difference, that's where the vernacularization of a high philosophy of Vedanta happens. So it does, the medieval kind of comes out in glimpses, but I do take the point very seriously that it's not adequate. It's not adequate and which is and which is to do with again the constraints of the discipline of history and my struggle against it, which is and 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 the question why no contemporary is a kind of connected question, in a sense that the periodization structure of not just thought but the archives and the texts is so strong that it's very difficult to breach except through poetic license, Sujata. And I am trying, and my, my uh, next project, which I can only speak of very fearfully, will be, and I'm hoping, I mean, this is a kind of ambition yet, will be to ask the question, if a kind of history of political thinking across ancient medieval modern times is even thinkable without its some subsumption in contemporaneist categories. Can such a history speak to the contemporary by in some senses unsettling the contemporary? Um, so while, of course, who is not invested in the contemporary, like all of us, we are living it and suffering it. But my hunch is that there needs to be a freedom from the prison of the present, uh, which can only be done through some kinds of time travel and some kind of temporal license. Uh, now, any historian colleague of mine will shut me up at this very point, uh, but I want to try that out. And in that, I, I am actually have begun reading a lot of um, uh, earlier texts and uh, people like Uma or Muzaffar Alam will figure very centrally in this next project if I'm able to go through with it. Now, so that's the question is very much at the heart of my thoughts. And I thank you for bringing it on the table. Um, the, the question of the experiential the ontological, the real, the actual, and I might add the virtual uh, in this context, is the other question that is very much at, a, at the heart of, uh, of my thought and all, our, all of our thoughts at this time, and something that Saurabh is gesturing towards, Sujata is also gesturing towards. Now, these are slightly different questions. 
the question of the real and the empirical, as of now, I think like this. Again, very tentative and provisional. This is how I think now. I probably will change my mind like five years down the line. I mean, that license the academics give ourselves. I, I have actually at one point been a very serious reader of Roy Bhaskar. Um, and I quite liked his, uh, uh, also his own personal maverick style. Uh, I've heard him live too. Uh, that was fantastic. I actually see myself as a kind of, at this time, less as a critical realist, more as in the what the Deleuze scholars say, but I'm not like totally fond of using that term, but something like a radical empiricist. In other words, the facts, quote unquote, uh, or the, or the um, facts is not the right word, the worlds that interest me are the worlds that do not make sense within our existing intellectual frameworks. In other words, the worlds and the facts and the thoughts that have fallen by the wayside because it was neither sociological nor social, nor historical, nor secular, nor religious are the ones that interest me. These are the facts and the thoughts that have fallen by the wayside. And it's my job, I think, in this book and hopefully later too, to kind of own them up and try to think with them in the process, imploding our given received analytical frameworks. Uh, the ontological is somewhat a different question. And this connects to Saurabh's very, very central uh, um, question of the place of the experiential, the place of the intending subject. Who is the we? He asks, and quite rightly so. Um, um, now, I am like, again, I really don't have one answer to this question, but it's a question that that is the question which is the constant interlocution through which one thinks. Now, this much is very clear that the we that comes through or I think comes through in this book are not the standard we of, you know, class, caste, gender, tribe, right? Even though caste, class, gender, tribe figure throughout the book, right? Because in a sense, the we in my mind is neither a social, is never a sociological we, we or the sociological we never suffices in its being, nor is it, quote unquote, a cultural identity in, in the standard way that it's, we, we seem to think of the question of recognition today. Now, who is the we? Now, the, the, onto, the ontological turn that, ha, that has happened in the, in the object-oriented, uh, primarily in anthropology in, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, would ask a question such as, is the virus an intending subject? Talking of the contemporary. Does it determine the political? One would, of course, say yes. But is it, it is neither an intending subject, nor a we, nor even a life. Right. So how then does one think of that question? And when I say the virus, I say it simply because it's the most immediate and the most concerning of the, the non-intending agents that are working in, in our world today. But one could say the same about gods. One could say the same about animals. Uh, one could say the same, in fact, about humans who do not very clearly fit into either in the sociological we, as it were. So that's the question that I'm struggling with. And I am, I, I am thinking, I mean, Deepesh Chakraborty's new book uh, on the climate of history, that's kind of, that I have just started reading, uh, makes one point that I think is worth thinking about. I'm not very sure what I think about it yet, but it kind of responds to the experience question, Saurabh, in, in the sense that he says, that at the turning of the human into a, a geophysical force uh, as something that determines our planetary condition um, is something which is not available to experience. So we experience 
global uh, warming, we experience floods and fires, and we experience pandemics, but we do not experience ourselves as in the geological time of planetary change. And yet we are called upon to fashion a politics adequate to this challenge of planetary politics, right? Now, how does one then start thinking about politics when it cannot be translated into the experience question or indeed the social question then? Now, that's a question which is a tough one. I am not, I mean, again, there is, of course, uh, in the US academy, a very clear turn towards hyper objects and blah, blah, and, and, et, 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 and, you know, and which makes a very, very clear distinction between technological studies, STS, science technology studies, and political studies in a different way. It's exactly that kind of disciplinary division that we have to breach if we have to raise the political question. Uh, you know, just calling everything an actant is not really taking us very much forward. So yeah, okay, so machines are actants, we are actants, humans are actants, viruses are actants, animals are actants. Point taken, but so is the question that I'm struggling with. How does one fashion a politics adequate uh, uh, to uh, thinking that question? So I think I'll just stop here. I'm just, I just wanted to say how, how much you've made me think and this has been really fruitful um, for me to think with you guys, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Banerjee. And now I'm sure all our discussants would have to add some uh, one-liners after having listened to the author. So I would like to start with uh, Professor Dev Pathak, if uh, you would like to add anything. Uh, I understand uh, one can point out uh, uh, numbers of absences. Uh, and probably one would not disagree with the presence of those absences in a work like this. Still, I am unable to understand why it should not be considered a work in social sciences adequately social scientific material. If uh, Renaldo Rosaldo's anthropoetry could be anthropological work, then why can't we have Prathama Chatterjee's, Prathama Banerjee's uh, book as a social scientific work? So this is my one line. Prathama, <laughs> I'm not a sociologist at all. Um, I know, like of you, course. <laughs> all my degrees are in history. Uh, like you, I'm also a hybrid. But unlike you, I'm an imposter. You're not. <laughs> Okay. Now, on the empirical, actually, I find that Prathama uh, shows a remarkable fidelity to facts. Uh, but these are, uh, you know, these are, are um, she, what she unravels and construes are facts unexpected. These are facts which speak in the uneasy echoes of limiting doubt rather than repeat and deal in dead certainties. So that's an appreciation which I thought I didn't need to make, but you know, that is what is refreshing. Again, um, what is also refreshing is the decided non-vanguardism uh, of the book. The, you know, the, 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 the homilies which uh, used to, you know, so many books, uh, radicals, you know, ended in the 1970s and 80s, including Ranjit Guha's, on how, you know, the book was going to contribute to a revolution. <laughs> I mean, what was and sweet them? I've learned so much, you know. Actually, I, I wanted to clarify as well that, you know, um, whether it was elementary forms of religious life or elementary aspects of peasant insurgency, which I read first, um, you know, I, I read these books in three days. So I thought three days were going to be <laughs> adequate to read your thing. I did read it. So those ways of innocence are gone. There were these horrible interruptions of all, all descriptions. So I read it, but not the way I would have liked to. Okay. Um, you know, and so it's an ongoing thing for me. Along these lines, actually, um, you know, concerning what you said about the page, uh, you know, I have an essay on scholasticism and in modern scholasticism and imminence in a book uh, Ajay Skaria, uh, Sanjay Seth and I did on the page. I the missed point, it. I'd read that. Absolutely. Uh, but the point is this. After the page read that essay, and it has a discussion of 
questions of imminence, including in, in dialogue with Akhil Bilgrami. And the page basically said, uh, the page basically said that, you know, for you, the question is the human. You know, as you were saying, it is experience, human, imminence, you know, um, what happens to the geological. And I went into the non human, the geological, I don't understand. Finally, you know, in the end, you, uh, in that determinedly sort of uh, non vanguardist way, uh, you know, you, you speak about the pleasure in some senses of discussion and the text, and I couldn't be more with you. But what struck me also was the pleasures are there, but what about the pain and the loss? And I'm not bringing in the poor. I'm bringing in the pain and the loss, including of reading. And I'll end with that. I think you're a little too kind to the decolonial. Okay? Uh, <laughs> Take it. There, is, there is something millenarian there, and it's right. a millenarian right. uh, which is about vanguards. Mm -hmm. I have two quick uh, clarifications, uh, if that is required, perhaps. One is I was certainly not uh, seeking disciplinary engagement, or that that was uh, certainly not uh, what I uh, was looking at. Uh, this is why I started with Kabir uh, and uh, his iconoclasm. And it is precisely the wonder, disciplinary wanderlust, disciplinary blasphemy. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed and I found this book immensely thought provoking and insightful. So that's one uh, clarification. And this is uh, this clarification I wanted to make because uh, it is because it is a kind of disciplinary blasphemous book. One is one can take liberty and do this blasphemy of talking about absences. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's 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 a blasphemy to talk about absences while you know discussing a book. Uh, uh, and you know, the the obvious way would be to talk about what you know uh, author writes uh, instead of what author does not write. But I took this liberty. And this clarification is required, I thought, because when I was invoking the idea of medieval or the contemporary, the, I, I used these two words, I was certainly not looking uh, these words in the way in which history approaches these words or these terms. But, but I was perhaps, you know, your book allows this provocation. Uh, this this you know uh, reader to venture into you know asking more perhaps uh, bill mange more <laughs> uh, <laughs> is is you know uh, there is i i am not aware of any substantive you know work where the impact of medieval how medieval legacies pans out in the making of the modern is engaged but you know for example you, you talk about the figure of Fakir. Uh, and we, we constantly, you know, we come across readings of, on, on Bairagya, Vedanta. But what about, you know, the way Suhravardi's conceptualized politics as, as well-being, and then they intervened. And mm -hmm. the way they, they very consciously opposed Chisti's non-political engagement. So, are there ways, I don't have any answer, but just because your book provokes so much, uh, one wants to you know, venture into these unknown directions of, you know, uh, or for example, how this, not the, the idea of history or the discipline of history, but idea of the historical goes into making of the modern political. Because, you know, all these figures from, from Vivekanand to uh, you know, Gandhi, they are mobilizing the past mm -hmm. in different ways, mm -hmm. even if not history. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, or when, when Rabindranath Ta uh, uh, Tagore uh, mobilizes the poetic uh, by, uh, you know, going into the past. So, you know, there are different constellations of the historical, but obviously everything cannot be done in one book. But, you know, as, as, as a reader, one can take liberty. And this is why I said that I'm not reviewer. I, I'm just sharing my my joys, my my what my deal mange more, rather than <laughs> you know doing a very uh, you know uh, 
and in that in that sense it's a, you know talking about absence might be blasphemous okay. that. thank you i traced a, traced a genealogy which had a certain kind of resolution which is never a final resolution but a momentary resolution and and placed it in front of another genealogy which had a different way journey and a different travel to it what does one learn from each of these is the question i was asking and therefore it may um help to i think to push it push the boundaries mm -hmm. in different ways and i i thought that this is the best way to deal with the text i was reading and um it indicates to me at least this text that it does come as a breaking point because it brings together you know you use the term extra a lot mm -hmm. so it brings the extra disciplinary in new ways but the disciplinary as you have remarked like governmentality is of power however the disciplinarity also has broken up and those genealogies of breaking up those power structures need to be engaged with without accepting that they remain as they are mm -hmm. and um i hope that within because it has happened within history it's happened within sociology anthropology economics also now in a very fundamental way that we move together with them and therefore i was recalling back journey i think much more than to say thank you deeply touched again you know i just wanted to add that unlike what we think when we do historically and uh, our time any time the present is actually always animated by the presence of pasts in the way that we very often are not able to intuit right in tweet so at uh, sadan says and he rightly so that it might have been interesting to actually uh, say more about how for instance somebody like um gandhi to take any other uh, any any example really gandhi is actually strongly um remobilizing history as hindu right does today as leftists did uh, uh, 10 years 20 years ago uh, and yet to also show at the same time how actually it's not so much that historical reinvention as these unconscious shadows of the past that animate people more strongly than actually the conscious you know history war that is going around going on in um so even in today's time and i think i find it very very important um in the bengal elections that is going on right now there is a very very strong presence of the medieval fakiri site of purpura sharif right uh and i mean and this has nothing to do with the wahhabi past on the one hand or this also called hindu past on the other it's a past of a different kind that is actually not narratable at least in the language that either political commentary or political writing is happening today on the bengal elections so i'm interested in those counterintuitive uh presences of the past which are beyond the purview of the history wars um so and i find that quite interesting and exciting and one very very important figure and I, i'm doing a um, small project and i'm not sure whether i'll be able to do it with full just justice but one interesting figure to really probe here is actually ambedkar because he does a kind of historical work i mean tagore was of course an anti, 
anti-historicist. He had major critiques of history, historical consciousness as a way of thinking about time and civilization. But Ambedkar is actually very seriously engaged in a very counterintuitive kind of historical project. And I don't think they've really thought through that very, very carefully. Uh, you know, uh, there is now work happening uh, among by many scholars, but I think there is one good example, just, just as a kind of general response to the question of the presence in the, uh, the past in the present and vice versa. And so I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Banerjee. And uh, thank you so much to all the discussants and the author. I'm sure the readers of the book will have a deeper plunge into the allegories of the political. And also, I'm sure you all are getting good burps after this heavy meal. So we will come back again once we are empty stomach. Thank you so much. <laughs>